Good morning to you again. My thanks to the Alexander family for their wonderful reading of our scripture to Hazel, to Reuben, and to Tammy. Thank you for sharing that gift with us in worship this morning. And my thanks to all of you who are joining us on this Palm Sunday, wherever you may be, we're grateful that you're able to be with us today in worship. Palm Sunday has always been a perplexing day for me, especially as I named last year, since palms themselves are only mentioned in one of the Gospels, John's Gospel, and that's not our scripture today. But maybe it's actually quite fitting today that we are waving whatever we can in our palm processional that we enjoyed earlier because that's exactly what they were doing in Matthew's gospel, picking up whatever they could find to wave to celebrate this day. Today, as we look at both Palm Sunday and the Beatitudes, we have the opportunity to see how the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus in both scriptures intersect with the disciples and the crowd's actions then and with our actions today. Here again, these words from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Will you pray with me? Let the songs I sing bring joy to you. Let the words I say profess my love. Let the notes I choose be your favorite tune. And God, let my heart be after you. God, let my heart be after you. Oh God, speak to me. God, speak through me. God, speak in spite of me, that on this day, in these moments, your will would be done. Amen. Our beatitude for this week is blessed are the pure in heart. If you were with us on Wednesday for Evensong, you know that I shared that this beatitude, many scholars think, is a restating of Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. It reads, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and who do not swear deceitfully. So instead of quoting this psalm, we have Jesus reshaping it into a beatitude and accompanying it with the promise of seeing God. On Wednesday and in our small groups this week, we talked a lot about the purity of heart. On Wednesday, I talked about this meaning more than just having pure thoughts, but also being a reminder that to have purity of heart means to pursue a single-minded devotion to God, as New Testament scholar M. Eugene Boring puts it. This psalm and this scripture from the Beatitudes were written in a time when polytheism was rampant in the world. When so many people had their hearts divided, focusing on this God for this need and this God for another need. But the teachings of all of the Abrahamic faiths of Judaism and Christianity call us back to one God, the one true God. Not to have our hearts divided amongst different deities, but to focus on the one true God. 
This same idea is referenced in one of my favorite psalms, the 86th Psalm, verse 11, which reads, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. This same concept is also echoed in the book of James, where James warns against being double-minded and having a divided heart in chapter 4, verse 8. This teaching of Jesus in the Beatitudes has resonance throughout our scriptures, and I believe sets us up for a powerful look at the story of Palm Sunday and our entrance into Holy Week. In Matthew's telling of Palm Sunday, this is the first time in the whole gospel that Jesus has been to Jerusalem. Before this moment, Jesus had been in Judea, in Galilee, and all around Jerusalem, and now he's finally coming into the city. And it's not so much a triumphal entry as the notes above this section in many Bibles say, but I see it more as a celebratory one of a humble king who rides in not like the classic triumphant king on his big proud war horse. No, instead we find Jesus in verse 7 riding on a donkey in the cult of a donkey. Jesus, the humble and gentle king. Jesus redefining kingship and its very nature not just with his words, but with his actions and his example. And the crowds acknowledge him and cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. The word Hosanna that they cry comes from Psalm 118, verse 25, which originally was a prayer, meaning save, I or we beseech you. But sadly, by the first century, it had become to mean not much at all. It had become a meaningless word just like we say when we say Hosanna, or excuse me, when we say Huzzah or Hurrah. And originally the words that followed in their celebration of Jesus come from Psalm 118 verse 26. And these words were referring to one who was coming into Jerusalem to worship God in the temple. And while that is a part of what Jesus does, in fact, in Matthew's Gospel, it's a, what he does immediately after these scriptures, where he makes another quite notable entrance. These words have since come to mean the one who comes from God, referring to Jesus' coming to earth for the redemption of humanity. That brings us then to these crowds, Jesus' disciples and followers who have followed Jesus in his ministry outside Jerusalem are now the ones who fetched the donkey and the colt, and who are announcing to the city who Jesus is. For the people of Jerusalem didn't know him by sight, probably had only ever heard of him. I wonder if perhaps the people of Jerusalem responded to Jesus in the same way that some of the Scottish warriors responded to their first sight of William Wallace in the movie Braveheart, being surprised at who it was that was before him, saying to themselves, is that him? That's, that's, not, that's not what I was expecting. It's also ironic that the crowd, this crowd, should shout Hosanna hailing Jesus as the son of David, celebrating him in the same way that they celebrated Solomon, also a son of David. And yet, will in just a few days' time be the same crowds who are shouting, crucify him. As the crowds call out to the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, calling him the prophet, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they get the words right, but they miss the point. As Dr. Boring put it, they have all the notes, but none of the music. There is a disconnect between what they know in their heads and what is in their hearts and what manifests in their actions just a few days later. 
Jesus foreshadowed this in Matthew 7, 21, saying that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. It takes more than just that. It takes doing the will of God. It takes having a purified heart that is focused on God and doing God's will. Dr. Boring put it this way. He wrote, one that is a social psychologist said of university students, something that is also true of the kingdom. It is possible to make an A plus in the course of ethics and still flunk life. Let me say that again. It is possible to make an A plus in the course on ethics and still flunk life. We can say all the right words, sing the right hymns, be even present at the right moments when we want to be seen as part of the right crowd. But if we don't have a heart that is set upon God, that pursues every day doing the will of God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we will be no different than those who said crucify him. We will have missed the point and flunked the practice of what we claim to know. Faith in God and God alone and doing God's will requires the kind of devoted faith that Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 and Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, the greatest commandment, call us to. In that faith, where the many-mindedness of the world is rejected, we have the possibility then to see and witness God in our midst today and in the world to come. This idea of having a pure heart is something that is found in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament and in the New Testament from Deuteronomy to the Gospels, from the Psalms to Revelation and many places in between. For us today, so long as we are still alive on this earth, the good news is we can get it right. We can make the connection between our heads and our hearts and our hands and feet so that that which comes from us is light and love. And we know and trust and believe that there is abundant grace for the moments when we fall down and don't quite make it. See last week's sermon for more about grace and mercy. Beloved, what a time for us to seek a renewal of one's faith, to purify our hearts. In a season when so many are in need, when there is so much fear and so many things clouding our judgment, what a season in the history of our world to seek to purify our hearts, to pray and study and discern and seek to know what God's will is for us in our homes and in the safe ways that we connect with the world beyond our homes. Don't be like the Pharisees that Matthew talks about and. 23 verse 25 polished and pretty on the outside but inside their hearts and souls are full of greed and self-indulgence first clean the inside of the cup christ says so that the outside may also become clean all that muck that creeps in and seeks to clog our hearts and our souls seeks to cloud our minds and our vision to keep us from seeing this world as God would have us to see it. Things from greed and self-indulgence as Jesus named for the Pharisees or divisiveness or arrogance or pride or self-righteousness that keep us in our modern times, just to name a few. Instead, I invite you to hear again these words from the song I sang at the beginning of this message. Words from the chorus of the song Garden by the group Need to Breathe. 
Let the songs I sing bring joy to you. Let the words I say profess my love. Let the notes I choose be your favorite tune. And God, let my heart be after you. God, let my heart be after you. May our hearts be after and for God, pursuing God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we may with joy love our neighbors. May we sing, speak, study, worship, serve, and more with hearts such as these, that we might be the blessed ones Christ is calling us to be, and that our world so desperately needs. Amen.